Hey there, once again, YouTube. My name is Ben Ferriolo. First off, if this video or intro is too long for you, then please skip to a part that interests you by utilizing the parts sections shown in the description box below. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like my work. Also, please visit my website. It contains an amazing amount of information. It can show you how to find seismic data, how to analyze it, with what programs to analyze it with, and much more. It even shows you earthquake examples and hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images pertaining to many different earthquake swarms and events. There is a link in the description box below right under my email address. This is the monthly volcano report for March 2019. The reported earthquake counts I state are taken directly from the United States Geological Survey and their partners and are only earthquakes reported, not earthquakes recorded. In regards to earthquake counts, it is likely a lot of the time that the reported earthquake total for a given location and time period, mostly during earthquake swarms, is lower than the actual count of earthquakes, in certain cases sometimes drastically lower. This has to do with a multitude of factors including inability to locate, lack of instruments, and other reasons that to be honest make no sense. You can especially see this on my new Yellowstone Rapid Fire Earthquake Swarm page, which is on my website under the Seismic Events drop-down menu. It is my goal to eventually major in seismology and also study volcanology, but I do believe I am properly equipped to give you guys a heads up if anything concerning may occur at volcanoes throughout the United States. Remember, most earthquake swarms at volcanoes do not lead to any eruptions, but almost every eruption is preceded by an earthquake swarm. Therefore, swarms should always be monitored closely, especially ones that are underreported but clearly show hundreds of events. Now, the volcanoes I will be doing monthly and yearly updates on will be Yellowstone Supervolcano in Wyoming, Long Valley Supervolcano in California, Newberry Caldera in Mount Hood in Oregon, Mount Rainier in Mount St. Helens in Washington State, and Mount Shasta in Lassen Peak in California. Glacier Peak, a volcano that is only about 50 miles or so east of me, has no monitoring instruments except one mediocre seismograph. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is putting new instruments there soon. Hopefully, and Glacier Peak will be added to the updates once monitor installation has been completed. In this video and other updates, we will look at earthquake and deformation counts. The time period of the reported earthquake counts for this video, derived from the USGS Earthquake Catalog, is from 0 UTC, March 1st, 2019, to 2359 UTC, March 31st, 2019, and magnitudes are always going to be negative 0.5 and above, so you will see every single earthquake that was reported for this time period. Yes, earthquakes can occur at negative, mag excuse me, negative magnitudes, but require sensitive seismographs to accurately locate. Thank God, a lot of the seismic instruments being activated these days are sensitive enough for such recordings. I like to call these negative earthquakes micro-minis. Every month's update will be uploaded about five days or so after the month in question has ended. Sorry again that this is a little bit late. Also, in regards to the three plot seismic images I generate for the largest events, I will always try my best to use the closest seismic station to any given event. As always, let's start with Yellowstone. Now, here we are at Yellowstone. There were 130 earthquake events reported for the Yellowstone Caldera Area and National Park for the month of March 2019. Although the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory states there were 127, YVO's perimeter and my perimeter of the park might be slightly different. I think my perimeter is just slightly larger. Regardless, the count is correct for this time period and location box. There were multiple moderate swarms during March, including a burst of seismicity west of Norris, right in this area, right here, far west of Old Faithful, in this area right here, and far to the northeast of Yellowstone Lake. Now, I have not done any analysis pages for these swarms yet, but I might soon. Now, they were not too crazy, and no major rapid-fire swarms broke out near West Thumber Yellowstone Lakes during this month. This month's reported seismicity is much higher than February's, which only had a total of 89 earthquakes. Also, guys, if you want to see the monthly update from the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, they are now doing video monthly updates, and it wasn't actually that bad. I, I actually kind of liked it. They, it was very well put together, I believe, at least in my opinion. It was very well put together. Just go to the Yellowstone Volcano page on uh, volcanos.usgs.gov, scroll down, and click monthly update for April 1st, 2019. Michael Poland is the one doing the update. But let's look at the update here. Now, there were four water eruptions of Steamboat Geyser in March 2019 on March 4th, March 11th, 17th, and 25th. Discharge measured at the Tantalus stream gauge suggests that these eruptions were similar in size to those that occurred earlier in the current sequence. Now that may be possible, guys, but the amplitudes from these steamboat geyser eruptions are still very small, and so I don't know why 
the amplitudes are so much smaller, but the amount of water being put out is still a good amount. So I still don't know why that's happening, but who knows. During March 2019, the U of U seismograph stations responsible for the operation analysis of Yellowstone Seismic Network located 127 earthquakes in Yellowstone, the largest being a 3.3 located 14 miles north-northwest of Pahaskatipi, Wyoming. I'm just going to say northeast of Yellowstone Lake. On March 4th, at 10.16 a.m. Mountain Time, the earthquake was not reportedly felt. March seismicity in Yellowstone included two swarms of earthquakes. The first swarm of 26 located 16 miles east-northeast of West Yellowstone, Montana, from March 25th to 26th and ranged from magnitude 0.1 to 1.9. A second smaller swarm of 17 earthquakes located about 9 miles west of Old Faithful, actually, on March 28th, and ranged in magnitude from 0.1 to 2.0. Earthquake swarms like these are common. Yes, yes, yes. Now, there were no significant changes in surface deformation, as you will see in a second, in the Yellowstone areas recorded by GPS stations. Grand subsidence of Yellowstone continues, as it has since about 2015. Of course, there have been small spikes and uplift here and there, but it has been pretty much constant since 2015, at a rate of a few millimeters per month. And as you will see with the GPS data, you uh, trust me, you can see it yourself. And plus, you can even gather GPS data yourself, too. I'll show you how to do that in just a bit. Actually, I already showed you. You just got to go to my website uh, in the How-To drop-down menu and go to the GPS chart page. In the area of Norris, GPS data indicated no vertical deformation. That area has shown little net change since October 2018. It was a pretty accurate update, guys, and I like the video update that they did have. Now, they say ground subsidence continues at Yellowstone at a rate of a few millimeters per month. This is probably true, and we will look at the GPS data in just a second. Again, Steamboat did erupt four times in the month of March. Now, here we are at the Steamboat Geyser 2019 page. Remember, go to my website. Link is below my email address in the description box below. Go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu and click this two Steamboat pages. Remember, I have one for 2018 and the current one for 2019, which shows the seismic plots and images to every single Steamboat Geyser eruption since it started in early 2018. Let's go down. The 11th eruption of 2019 occurred on March 25th. It's this one right here. Let's zoom up just a little bit. This one right here, you can tell it was slightly stronger in amplitude than some of the previous eruptions during this year. Actually, I believe it was the largest according to the amplitude. I'm just saying just according to the seismic amplitude, it was apparently the largest steamboat geyser eruption in 2019, in my opinion. In my, in my opinion. There it is right there. Go down. The 10th eruption in 2019 occurred on March 17th. Here it is right here. Scroll all the way down. And here it is right there. It was pretty weak. That one was a very weak eruption. However, this one right here is <laughs> probably the weakest eruption. The 9th eruption in 2019 occurred on March 11th, 2019. And the first eruption burst preceded the main eruption by about 12 minutes. Click here for much more info regarding this strange eruption which actually showed on Seismic Station Y and R, I believe. And even though the amplitude was much smaller, it showed there was a much larger spike in water that was ejected from this eruption, which is pretty strange. Pretty strange how the amplitudes were smaller, but the amount of water was greater. I don't know why that would be. And there it is right there. You can barely see it at all. And then the eighth eruption of 2019 occurred on March 5th, which was the first eruption of March, the month of March for 2019. There it is right there. For the Yellowstone Supervolcanic Complex, the largest earthquake to occur within the Mar uh, month of March 2018 was magnitude 3.3 at 6.0 kilometers in depth, which is slightly larger and more shallow than last month's largest event. And this 3.3 struck far to the northeast of Yellowstone Lake, occurring with some other reported events. This magnitude 3.3 also appeared on virtually every single seismic station at Yellowstone, like it should, and actually even beyond. Let's take a quick look at this event. Although stations YMP and YPC were the closest, for some reason they did not detect these events quite as well as the third closest station, which was YPK. YPK is the station I will use for the following data. Here we have the data stream from seismic station YPK for the time period of the largest earthquake and the following earthquakes as well. For And the largest earthquake occurred on March 4th. Let's see, at about, let's see, what was it? What time did this occur at? 17, 16, 43. And remember, it takes a little bit to travel, and so this is it right here. Remember, amplitudes are cut at a, around 32,000 amplitude count when dealing with these short period seismic stations at only at Yellowstone. 
Other stations in other areas don't do that. Some do, some don't. I really hope they upgrade them eventually to where nothing gets cut at all. But that doesn't really matter since we see the duration, we see the type of event, and everything like that. So this is the largest event of March 2019. Megs do 3.3. I believe it was at 6.0 kilometers in depth. Station YPK is the third closest seismic station. It's strange to note that these earthquakes barely even showed on the closest station at all, which I thought was very odd. Dominant lower frequencies. I mean, we should see some slightly lower frequencies since this station is the third closest seismic station and is some distance away. But frequencies are a little bit lower than uh, what I would expect. Here, let me turn log frequency off. You can see on the spectra plot, dominant frequencies obviously below 5 hertz, with the main power being between 0 0.6 hertz and 2.5 hertz. So that's very strange. Very strange for any earthquake, but obviously it was not a low frequency earthquake. You can see frequencies going well beyond 25 hertz. Let's go forward. There were other earthquakes during this day, multiple aftershocks, smaller frequencies, smaller frequencies right here. I do not know what this is right here. This could be another regional earthquake or a mine blast because they have been doing a bunch of strange, strange mine blasts lately in, uh, what is it, eastern Wyoming. In a strange spot, I mean, they've been doing it for years. I mean, I think longer than a decade. But without how many mining explosions they do and how large the explosions are, sometimes able to be felt by multiple people in the area, there must be a huge cavern, like a huge city down there, guys. I mean, they've been blasting that place for <laughs> the longest time. And right here, we do see some actual mining explosions, I believe, unless those are regional earthquakes. But again, here's the largest earthquake for Yellowstone for the, March of two, uh, the month of March 2019. There it is right there. Again, here is the spectrogram with dominant frequencies resting below 5 hertz, but obviously we see weaker frequencies going well above that. So it is interesting to note that this burst in seismicity occurred in a strange location. However, as of the past few months, this location is not as strange as you would think. Actually, there is a burst in seismicity near this location in January of this year. It occurred north-northeast of Yellowstone Lake, somewhat near the earthquake uh, that the magnitude 3.3 at 6.0 kilometers in depth, which was the largest during March, in, back in January, on January 6, 2019 of this year, there was a swarm somewhat near that location. Here's uh, the majority of the earthquakes in, the, in that swarm. Excuse me. The quantity of the swarm was not great. I agree. There weren't that many, but the magnitudes were much larger and occurred in a very close space. It was a very, very odd swarm, guys. It was very weird. You can see it on the web recorder right there. Let's scroll down. You can see this is the location right here. I believe the largest earthquake, the magnitude 3.3 for March, occurred somewhere up here, I believe. But it's still around this area, though. And remember, this swarm on January 6th occurred just south of Amethyst Mountain, which, personally, I have never really seen earthquake swarms occur there before. Again, this post is on my website under the Seismic Events drop-down menu under Yellowstone Super Volcano, and you have to scroll through all the way down to the January 6th swarm. All right, now here are the GPS stations for Yellowstone Caldera. Let's go to LKWY. This is the GPS deformation chart for the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake at station LKWY. Now, keep this in mind. When viewing the following blue charts, Please note that the top chart here, which says east, shows east-west horizontal deformation. The middle chart here, which says north, shows north-south horizontal deformation. And the final chart at the bottom here shows vertical deformation. In other words, uplift or subsidence. Again, the top two are horizontal, and the last one at the bottom that says up is vertical. Although all three directions are important, the main one to keep an eye on is the vertical chart at the bottom. The data seems to have stopped when LKWY was offline, but I believe the data is now being recorded again. However, Seismic Station LKWY, I believe, is offline again. At, and last time the Seismic Station went down, so did the GPS station as well. I don't know what is going on with LKWY. I think they really need to fix it. There seems to be neither uplift or subsidence occurring, maybe a little bit of subsidence. So let's just go take a look at another station. The vertical chart here shows a range of 0 0.3 meters from bottom to top since about 2004, right back here. Now let's go to the GPS station near Old Faithful in the Upper Geyser Basin, which I believe is where the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome is. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Here is OFW2 near the Upper Geyser Basin. Here it seems the data stream is uninterrupted. We see it is likely subsidence is continuing to be recorded on this station. However, it is quite hard to tell. 
the north-south chart doesn't show much. And same goes for the east-west chart right here. Notice there's a tiny bit little change on the north chart, but nothing too major. If uplift starts again, which I truly believe will happen in the next two years at the max, then it will show greatly on these stations just like the last two periods of uplift did. Now, I believe it'll start again in the next two years based on the past two episodes of deformation, not to mention the other ones that have happened throughout monitoring history. Please note that is only a theory and that could be very wrong. Notice that we are at the lowest level. Notice this right here, the most recent data. Let's go all the way over. We are at the lowest level since about late 2006, early 2007. If this pattern of breathing will continue, we should see another round of uplift soon. However, that remains to be seen. The vertical chart at the bottom here shows a total range of 0.25 meters from bottom to top. Now for OFW2, let's take a closer look at recent deformation just for the past few months from January 1st to March 31st. Now before I start, with my custom GPS charts, so one of them shown here, I thought the STD dev standard deviation parameter was the correct choice. However, I believe I was wrong, I'm sorry guys, because the data never showed any growing or shrinking trends, even though the online GPS charts obviously showed a change. So from now on, I will use Delta. Remember, if you don't like my custom charts and want to create your own, simply go to my website, go to the How To drop down menu, and click the GPS page. The video on there will teach you how to gather GPS data and, and excuse me, analyze it yourself. But remember to use the parameter Delta when you're in Microsoft Excel instead of STD Dev. Now that way, nobody can deceive you for views or for money, and you yourself can decide whether uplift or subsidence is occurring. Here we see the data for OFW2 from January 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2019. This is more consistent with their findings, and when seeing other GPS data from other areas around the country, Delta is the best setting to use for the GPS data. We see subsidence is for sure occurring. Let's see here. Yep, I got a trend line. Subsidence is for sure occurring with a few spikes up and down here and there, but overall we do see subsidence at a rate of about a few millimeters per month or so. YVO states this as well, and we have the data to back it up. Just because subsidence is occurring now doesn't mean uplift won't start soon. I personally do believe uplift will start again in the next two years, but that's just a personal theory. And here we are back at the GPS page, uh, volcanoes.usgs.gov. Now here we have WLWY, which resides just a few miles northeast of LKWY at Yellowstone Lake. The top two horizontal deformation charts are not showing much of a change, just barely anything at all. Really, WLWY is one of the most calm GPS stations at the call there, at least in my opinion, recently, as of recent data. But we do see a total range for the vertical deformation chart at the bottom of 0.45 meters from bottom to top. And here's the custom GPS deformation chart showing uplifted subsidence for WLWY from January 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2019. Now when viewing these custom GPS charts I make, always remember the labels on the left, these numbers right here, are in meters. To discover how many millimeters any given number is, simply move the decimal point to the right three times. So right here it'd be one, two, three, minus 10 millimeters. But from here to here, I believe would be five millimeters. Remember, these do not show the actual level of the ground. This simply shows us and allows us to determine the changes and the size of the changes for any time period we want. According to the data, it seems even less subsidence is occurring here, but still subsidence is occurring at the rate YVO determined. This can be proven by accessing and analyzing GPS data, which is somewhat hard to do at first, yes, but it definitely is worth it. And here we are back at the Yellowstone deformation page. Let's go to NRWY which is at the North Geyser Basin, near where Steamboat Geyser resides. As before, it does seem like the uplift here has stopped. But why don't we take a look at the most recent data for the past four months. In total, the vertical chart here shows 0.25 meters, or in other words, 250 millimeters, from bottom to top. Now here we have the GPS deformation data, the vertical data, for NRWI. Here we see uplift or subsidence being recorded. Actually, neither has been consistently occurring since January 1st, or maybe even a little bit prior to that. That is very interesting, and to be honest, doesn't make much sense. Why is some of the caldera subsiding, but Norris is not? 
Note the trend line here actually shows no growing or shrinking trends. It's basically just straight throughout the entire area. That's very interesting. Now, from line to line, for example, from this line to this line, each horizontal section is a total of 10 millimeters. Now let's move on to another potentially dangerous supervolcano called Long Valley Caldera, which resides in California, right near Yosemite National Park. All right, here's Long Valley Supervolcano. Now it might be a little bit hard to see, but we do have a little tiny earthquake here, a few tiny earthquakes here, some tiny earthquakes down here near Bishop, just to the northwest of Bishop. Most of the activities right here and down here as well. There were 352 reported earthquakes for Long Valley Caldera for the month of March 2019. That is much higher than February's totals. Long Valley Caldera is a massive supervolcano with around 240 cubic miles of magma just sitting down there, just below the surface. If it erupted at full potential today, it could be about 800 times more powerful than the eruptions of Mount St. Helens in the 80s, which pummeled my mother's house with inches of ash and even rained ash on my dad's old car in Colorado. Of course, there is no major sign of that right now, but uplift has been virtually constant since the late 70s, of course, with subsidence occurring here and there. The area has also seen intense seismicity in the past, which correlated with large degassing and uplift. In my opinion, Long Valley is of a much more immediate danger than Yellowstone. However, knowing how volcanoes act suggests that really doesn't matter. One day, one volcano could be a threat, and the next day, it'll be another volcano. You just never know for sure with these things, which is why it is best to monitor these areas closely. As usual, we see most of the seismicity is centered around the southwestern portion, at somewhat the southwestern portion. Here's the Long Valley Caldera area right here. Most of the time, it is in the southwest to southern section. Right now, it seems actually to be centered around the southern section, spreading far to the south. Notice that? Very interesting. Again, as I said, most of the seismicity usually is around the southern section, the southwest section of Long Valley. And coincidentally, as you're about to see in just a second, the ground is indeed moving to the southwest and has been for some time. So usually the seismicity is located on the deformation front. The, large earth, the largest excuse me, earthquake to occur in the month of March was a magnitude 3.0 earthquake all the way down here to the south at 0.6 kilometers in depth. Although it could be connected to Long Valley and its processes, I like to use an earthquake a little bit closer to the caldera for the following plots. That would be this one right here, the second largest earthquake, which was a magnitude 2.8 at 7.4 kilometers in depth on March 18, 2018 at 1856 UTC. For your convenience here, the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the second largest earthquake to occur at Long Valley Supervolcano within the month of March. We see it as a normal volcano tectonic earthquake, normal high frequencies. Dominant frequencies actually lasting, not lasting, excuse me, actually being below 15 hertz, majority being below 10 hertz, and the majority, the most powerful frequency, being at about, I'm going to say, 7 hertz or so. A normal high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, which is the part of normal background seismicity at volcanoes worldwide. And here we have the deformation instruments for Long Valley Caldera. Let's go to P639. Again, when, blue, uh, excuse me, when viewing these blue three-chart images, the top chart shows east-west horizontal deformation. The middle chart shows north-south horizontal deformation. And the bottom chart here shows vertical deformation, in other words, uplift or subsidence. Surprisingly, since about November to December of last year, you see November 2018, probably about November or December, right around there, late November, subsidence has been occurring at a very interesting rate. That is very surprising, especially with the amount of magma down there, guys, and just how active this supervolcano is under the surface. However, we have seen subsidence events like these before, and it is highly likely uplift could start again at any time. Also notice how both horizontal components are heading downwards. You notice that? Well, the top component here is east, and the middle component here is north. This means, since both are heading downwards steadily, that the ground is constantly moving to the southwest, though at a slow rate. The vertical chart from bottom to top is a total of about 0.08 meters, which is about 80 millimeters. Yellowstone still sees much higher deformation counts in the long run than Long Valley does, but I still think Long Valley should be monitored extremely closely.
And here's my custom vertical GPS deformation chart for P639, the GPS station I just showed. Remember, measurements are in meters. Whenever you want to determine how many millimeters these are, simply move the decimal point to the right three times. So that means from this line to this line here, each horizontal section is a total of about 10 millimeters. These GPS instruments are supposedly accurate down to one millimeter change. It seems subsidence does continue as of the most recent data, as seen by the GPS data here from January 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2019. It looked like subsidence stalled in the middle here a little bit, but it seems to be continuing. However, know that it's likely to change in the blink of an eye, and if uplift starts again, you will for sure know, since I would likely put out a blog post about it and add it to my next monthly report. Remember to always look at the data with no bias. So we were just right here at P639. Now let's go down to CA99, which is just to the southwest of P639. Let's click it right here. Now, contrary to the previous station I just showed for these blue three chart images, this one shows a much larger data stream going all the way back to about 2001, just before 2001, instead of May 2014, like we saw on the previous station. It seems right around 2011, is when Long Valley started to see increased, almost constant uplift patterns, though previous publications suggest uplift has been ongoing since the late 70s, obviously being caused by an influx of magma at depth. The top two horizontal charts are also suggesting that the ground is steadily moving towards the southwest, just like the other GPS stations at Long Valley Caldera. And, just like the other GPS stations, the vertical chart is showing a good spike, or should I say drop, in subsidence. For the vertical chart here at the bottom, we see a total range of 0 0.16 meters, or in other words, 160 millimeters, from the bottom of the chart to the top. Here we see the most recent vertical GPS deformation data showing uplift or subsidence for CA99. It seems subsidence is still ongoing at Long Valley as seen on the other GPS stations. This data is from January 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2019. Each horizontal section on this one chart from line to line is about 0 0.005 meters, in other words, only five millimeters. Here we are back at the monitoring page for Long Valley Volcanic Center with the GPS charts added. Let's go to SHRC down here near the southwest section of Long Valley Caldera. Now, I know in previous updates I have shown data for RDOM, which resides in the center of the caldera. I will now be showing SHRC instead, which resides on the southwest border of the caldera. Now, this station is much closer and is basically on top of an area of much more importance than the center of the caldera. Regardless, you can always find these stations by going to volcanos.usgs.gov. As usual, we saw a growing trend starting at about 2014, just barely. Although we know that trend started long, long, long before that time. We know now that it has stopped and subsidence is being recorded here as well. Just like every other GPS station in this area, and even stations around the perimeter of Long Valley Caldera beyond the caldera are showing the same subsidence event, which actually I thought that was very strange. Why is it more than Long Valley that is seeing subsidence? It's even many miles beyond the rim, which I thought was very strange. The two horizontal charts basically show what the, all of the other GPS stations showed, that the ground is heading to the southwest very slowly. The vertical chart at the bottom, from bottom to top, has a total range of 0 0.09 meters, in other words, 90 millimeters. And of course, just like the other GPS stations in the area, we see subsidence is occurring here as well. This is SHRC, the station that I just showed, with vertical data showing uplift or subsidence from January 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2019, a total of about four months. Each horizontal section from line to line is 0 0.01 meters, or in other words, 10 millimeters, which is double the size of the CA99 vertical chart. Next, let's move on to Newberry Caldera, one of my favorite volcanoes in the world. And here we have the Newberry Caldera volcano, which resides in central Oregon, just south of the city of Bend. It is a shield volcano with enormous volume and a good-sized magma chamber. Notice we have five reported earthquake events during the month of March 2019. It is likely this number is slightly higher, seeing there were a few lower frequency events that were not reported, and one that was actually removed 
This one was removed. I don't know why it was removed from PNS, and USG is still reporting it. But from the low frequency catalog, this was removed. And I'll show you that in just a second. Don't know why that happened. Let me turn on terrain real quick so you can see the terrain around the area. Turn on, buddy. There we go. So there's Newberry Crater. Now, low frequency events have been dominating recent seismicity at Newberry Caldera. Although Newberry is virtually very quiet, no more than a handful of quakes a month, the volcano rests at about 540 degrees Fahrenheit at only 3,000 feet below the surface. According to the University of Oregon, the highest temperature ever recorded at a Cascade volcano. I actually did two videos recently on Newberry. If you wish to see them, either look through my two most recent videos on my YouTube channel or come to this page here, which is on my website. Go to my website, the link is in the description box below under my email address. Go to the Seismic Events 2 drop down menu and click the Cascade page. Now I do not have the two videos posted on here yet, but they will be posted soon. This page contains many seismic plots and images of low frequency events at Cascade Volcanoes. I know I say all Cascade Volcanoes on this page, however the plots so far are only from Newberry since Newberry Volcano is basically the only Cascade Volcano to be experiencing low frequency earthquakes and possibly tremor as of late. I keep updating this page and this page even contains proof that PNS had removed some real low frequency earthquakes from their catalog for some unknown and strange reason. Actually, one of the recent low frequency events were removed as well. I actually saved a picture of this custom search. You can see the picture here. I took a screenshot just so I would catch it if it happened again. Now, I don't know if this is a glitch or done intentionally. Personally, it doesn't make sense for either way. But these were for sure low frequency events occurring right under Newberry. By the way, this is the custom PNSN search, which can filter specifically for low frequency events. I showed that in one of my recent videos. Notice multiple events reported for April 1st. So that's that April 1st, April 1st, April 1st, the 31st, the 26th. This is what I want you to focus on, the 26th right here. So let's search the event ID, see, EVID, which is the event ID for this one right here, which was removed. There was actually a low frequency earthquake added, that's not shown on here, for the 31st, but they removed the 0 0.8 that occurred on March 26th. Why would they do that? I don't know, but let's search the event ID, shall we? Here's the PNSN low frequency catalog. Now notice you have April 1st, April 1st, April 1st, March 31st, March 31st. So they did add one, but they took away the one that occurred on the 26th, which was supposedly the largest event to occur at Newberry for the month of March. Let's click refresh, see if any of them have been removed. Is it going to refresh? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Nope, none were removed and none were added. But they again, they removed the one from the 26th. Let's prove that, shall we? Let's go back to the image. Let's do that. So the 26th is 0 0.8 and 1.7 kilometers in depth. Over here, we see the largest event of March was a 0 0.8 and 1.7 kilometers in depth on the 26th. Okay, that's the same event. Let's go back. Now, what you do is you go up, let's go right here to this search button right here. Now, let's go back to the image. The event ID for the missing earthquake that was removed is 61514. So, let's go 61514. Let's go back to the photo. And let's see, 61, is that it? Yeah, 61514, 841 at the end. So, 8. 41. Now let's press search and see if we get it. Okay, so we do have an event right here, right? Oh, they didn't remove it. It's there. See, 0 0.8, 1.7 kilometers in depth. Event ID is the same event ID. This is the low frequency event that was reported. Let's go see the event page, shall we? Let's see the event page. Whoa. Huh? Queried event not found. Okay, but I have proof right here that this event ID was very real. I mean, this one right here. This event was very real, but they removed it. So, why would they do that? Doesn't make any sense, in my opinion. And this has not, uh, this is not the first time, guys. This has happened before, and I have shown proof on it, especially on the Cascades Low Frequency page. Now, I have not added these Low Frequencies uh, events yet to the Cascade page, but I will do that tonight or tomorrow night. Again, the largest reported event for Newberry Caldera was a magnitude 0.8 low-frequency earthquake 
which struck at 1.7 kilometers in depth right under the caldera. You can see it occurred. Where'd it go? Oh, actually, it wasn't right under the caldera. It was right under the caldera, but towards the northeast, right under the northeastern base. But still, it was a low-frequency earthquake. And you'll see that in a second. Especially when analyzing this in the seismic program swarm, you will see this was a low-frequency event. That, and the fact that PNSN initially reported it as an LF event, and that quarry or mine blasts, which can sometimes look similar to LF events, do not blast around this time, proves that this was very real. But if this was very real, then so were the many other events that occurred during this day that contained the same characteristics. So just know that if these really are real LF events, which are highly likely, then there are many, many, many of them that are not being reported for the past few months. Not just for this day, guys. Again, I say, past few months. But again, the magnitudes are not great, so it's nothing too concerning, right? at least right now. Here we have the most recent data stream from CPCL. Well, not the most recent, but the one for the 26th when that low-frequency event occurred, which was the, apparently the 0 0.8 was the largest event in Newberry Caldera for the month of March. We have the data stream added to the Seismic Program Swarm to persist a rescale off, set overlap to 95. Going to do a high-pass filter at about 0 0.8 hertz to the 6th power. Now, they said this low-frequency earthquake occurred at about 1411 UTC. So we're going to start right about here. Use the spectrogram to see if we can see anything. Now let's scoot forward. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Not seeing much. Background noise, background noise, background noise. Not seeing much. There's a little bit of something right there. A tiny, tiny earthquake. Don't know if that was a low frequency event or not. Did have dominant low frequencies, but it was pretty tiny. We see a tiny event right here. If this is an earthquake, it's definitely a low frequency earthquake. But if this was mine blast, these are not mine blasts. They look way different than this, guys. But sometimes minor quarry blasts can look like low-frequency events, but they're usually easily distinguishable, usually. Here we see another low-frequency event, very tiny. I doubt these are rock falls or avalanches, because, I mean, of course that can happen at Newberry, but Newberry is a shield volcano. It's not a strata volcano, so it's not going to have, like, an insane amount of landslides and uh, avalanches and stuff like that. Then we see another event right here with some dominant lower frequencies, and this is emergent. You know, this is very emergent, very odd, very strange looking. Very strange. Just keep going forward. We're still not to 1411 yet. We're still not there yet. Keep going forward, keep going forward. We see another event right here at about 1349 UTC. Dominant lower frequency still looking slightly emergent. Definitely looks like a low frequency earthquake, though. And it does show on ceramic stations. Now, here's where it starts to increase just a little bit. Notice, let's go back, we do have an event right here that was not reported. Again, it looks exactly like a low-frequency earthquake, exactly how they should look. And remember, on a long time ago, they removed a low-frequency earthquake, and I checked. I even emailed some of the mines and quarries in the area. They said it wasn't them. So it's likely these are not mine or quarry blasts, especially when they, the mine and the quarry last time said it was not them. This is the earthquake that they removed, that they initially reported as a low-frequency event. Apparently, it was a 0 0.8 and 1.7 kilometers in depth, just barely to the northeast. Notice the same characteristics as the other low-frequency events throughout this day. Let's go back to the spectrogram. Let's go to the spectral plot, actually. Dominant frequencies rest in between about 1.7 hertz and about 2.5 hertz, with the strongest frequency being around 2 hertz. Definitely a low-frequency event. Turn long frequency off. Oh yeah, that's a low frequency event. So that's very strange, guys. Why would, why do you think they would remove this earthquake? I, I, to me, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know. And here we have the GPS deformation instruments for Newberry Caldera. Now let's go to CPCO. Now this is a different type of GPS chart. The yellow line is vertical, in other words, uplift or subsidence. Blue is east-west, and green is north-south horizontal deformation. Now, I've showed these in many of my recent updates, and there has been no major changes as of late. And to save on time, I will not be showing any more GPS deformation charts in this video, except for Glass and Peak. However, I will if there is a big change. But if you don't believe me, or if you'd like to see it for yourself, all you have to do is go to volcanoes.usgs.gov, select a volcano of your choice, click Monitoring what's on that page, and use the settings on the right of the map to select GPS stations. GPS stations, at least so far, are always marked by a blue star. You can make your own GPS deformation charts. However, the GPS stations used by the Cascade Volcano Observatory still is not downloading correctly.
I still don't know how to access the real-time GPS data for these stations at Newberry. I can for Yellowstone, Long Valley, Mount St. Helens, and other areas, but for some reason not most of the volcanoes in the Cascade Range, which I think is very odd. Now here we are at one of the most infamous Pacific Northwest volcanoes, Mount Rainier, which adds a beautiful but potentially deadly backdrop to the Seattle skyline. Now there have only been six, yes six, reported earthquakes from Mount Rainier, five of them, actually four of them occurring under the mountain itself, one straggler down to the southwest and one straggler to the northwest. Let me turn on the terrain real quick, four right under the strata volcano. So, it seems Cascade Volcanoes keep getting quieter and quieter, which, to be honest, makes absolutely no sense. And by the way, guys, six earthquakes in one month for Mount Rainier, with the largest being a 1.0, that is small, guys. That is extremely quiet. Now, for over seven months now, Cascade Volcanoes have been more silent with each passing month. Of course, it varies. It goes up or down slightly. However, it is clear. Cascade Volcanoes are going silent. So why do you think the Cascade Range is becoming so quiet? Please let me know below. Now, the largest reported event for the month of March for Mount Rainier was this one right here. And it was a magnitude 1.0 earthquake at 1.3 kilometers in depth on March 23rd, 2019 at 2340 UTC. For your convenience here, the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount Rainier Stratovolcano within the month of March 2019. Okay, this is getting weird. But first off, this is a normal volcano tectonic earthquake, which is part of the normal background seismicity at volcanoes worldwide. However, the weird part of this earthquake is that every time recently I create the plots for the largest events for each month at Mount Rainier, they recently have all had this strange monochromatic high frequency signal. Notice that? This signal going all the way over here. It originates right when the earthquake does and dies down along with the event. This should not be part of the normal coda of this earthquake. The coda should be down here, as we see, but what is this? It's almost monochromatic, meaning one frequency, and the frequency of this one occurring around 22.3 hertz. This one looks more natural than the previous ones, but I now highly doubt that this is man-made. For some reason, the recent earthquakes at Rainier are creating this strange high-frequency signal, and I have no idea what that means or what it is being caused by. All I know that it's kind of strange. Here we are at the volcano that gave my mother a very bad day on May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens. This volcano pummeled my mother's house with inches of ash and even rained ash on my dad's car in Denver, Colorado. The main Mount St. Helens eruption ejected 0.29, yes, 0.29 cubic miles of ash compared to the possible 240 cubic miles Long Valley at the maximum could eject during its next eruption. For the month of March 2019, there were surprisingly 36 reported earthquakes, which is actually almost triple that of each previous month. Although Cascade Volcanoes seem to be quieting, St. Helens seems to be much higher. However, this number is around the normal number of earthquakes for any given month for Mount St. Helens, because recent, recent months it's been extremely low. But it is interesting to note that the large majority of this month's seismicity occurred on March 12, 2019, where there was actually a small swarm of earthquakes just under the dome in Mount St. Helens. Not to mention that the swarm occurred in an extremely small time period of only an hour or two. Of course, there was a few stragglers beyond that, but it was mainly constrained within about an hour or two. Very interesting. Very quick, but intense for how quick it was. The largest event for the month of March for Mount St. Helens occurred during this swarm and was reportedly a magnitude 1.0 earthquake at negative 1.7 kilometers in depth on March 12, 2019 at 216 UTC. Remember, negative depth does not mean it occurred above the ground. Obviously, earthquakes cannot occur 1.7 kilometers in the air. That just means it occurred above sea level, 1.7 kilometers above sea level. But I have noticed that whenever I see negative depths, they are sometimes very wrong, guys. So don't always 100% trust the depths, because sometimes they cannot constrain them very well. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. But we know that earthquakes don't occur in the air. I mean, that's impossible. Earthquakes are from rock breaking apart or faults faulting or stuff like that. You know, it's not going to occur in the air unless it's like a meteor burst. But you'll see it was part of this earthquake swarm. 
Okay, here we are in the seismic program swarm with station SEP in the CC network, short period vertical with no location code given. This uh, channel is from the station which was closest, supposedly closest to this earthquake swarm. We're going to get a good look at it. So the largest event was actually the first earthquake in this sequence that you can see here. There were also some very rhythmic, very emergent seismic bursts prior to the swarm, and it is likely either magma or magmatically derived fluids caused this event. Actually, this swarm seems very similar to some of the swarms that appear at Yellowstone from time to time. This was definitely some interesting activity for Mount St. Helens. Let's go through it just real quick. Look at these strange bursts in the beginning. Let me zoom out so you can kind of see them. Notice how they look very rhythmic. Notice that, and they're very emergent. Might be connected to the earthquake swarm, might not be, but when zooming out, they kind of do look like earthquakes as well. Especially when going down here to the actual earthquake swarm, you will see they, they seem to fall in line. Notice how before the earthquake swarm started, these weird emergent events with higher frequencies started becoming more and more and more and more and more. Notice that there's more of them and they're more closely spaced. And then boom, we see an earthquake that looks very similar to those emergent events. So it's likely they are connected to this earthquake swarm. Look at how many events occurred, guys. There were many events. I'm considering this a rapid fire swarm and the, uh, the rhythm of these events are pretty good. It's got a good rhythm to it, guys. It's not just like random and blotchy, spaced. You know, it's, it, I, I think this was caused by magma or magmatically derived fluids. In my opinion, this was not tectonic in nature. Let's keep going forward. Wow, very interesting, guys. This was a very interesting burst in seismicity during this time frame. And it is likely these other emergent events that got closer together and then farther apart. I think they are connected to the earthquake swarm. Let's just look at the earthquake, which was reportedly the largest earthquake and Mount St. Helens for the month of March. Here are the waveforms right here. Slightly emergent with an extended coda, a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but you know, I'm still new to all this, guys. I'm not a professional yet. There's still a lot of things I don't get. There it is. Dominant high range frequencies, a normal volcano tectonic earthquake, which is part of normal background seismicity at volcanoes worldwide. Now, here we are at the Mount Hood Volcano in Northern Oregon, which straddles the border between Washington and Oregon. Before I start, I just want to state that a new fault line has been discovered cutting through Mount Hood. A link will be posted below in the description box under resources. However, it'll probably be, be near the, uh, the end of the resources list at the bottom of the description box. They think this newly discovered fault could trigger around a magnitude 7, 7.2 earthquake at best. This is pretty crazy for any stratovolcano, guys. If that were to happen, it could really da damage the stratovolcano, <laughs> and not only geologically, but volcanically as well. Who knows what that type of earthquake could do to the magma chamber below. Again, this is just preliminary, but it's quite freaky that a fault like that rests under a stratovolcano that large. Now, for the month of March 2019, there were only two reported earthquake events, which is one earthquake higher than last month. Mount Hood is usually extremely quiet. Well at least for now. And for Mount Hood, these two events were likely all there was. One occurring under the summit right here, and one just barely to the southeast under the base. I must state, however, that there was an interesting increase in seismicity about a week ago, just north of Mount Hood, probably maybe 10 miles or so, not too far away from Mount Hood, but it was not at the volcano, but, and it wasn't major either, likely had no connection to Mount Hood, but you never know with these things. But as the Kilauea eruptions of 2018 taught us, magma is extremely powerful and extremely independent. It literally goes wherever it pleases and wherever it finds a weakness. The largest reported event for Mount Hood during the month of March was a magnitude 0 0.8 at 4.5 kilometers in depth on March 6, 2019 at 2.09 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur underneath Mount Hood during the month of March 2019. It was a magnitude 0 0.8 normal, high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, very small, occurring at 5.4.5 uh, kilometers in depth, excuse me, in depth under uh, the southeast base of Mount Hood. Normal mid to high range frequencies, and we see this is just a normal volcano tectonic earthquake, nothing too special about it. 
And here we are at the Mount Shasta Strata Volcano, which resides just south of the California-Oregon border. If you have ever driven from Southern Oregon into California using I-5, you already know that the volcano is very large. For the month of March 2019, there were only three reported earthquake events, which is one higher than last month's and two higher than the month before that. I know all of the Cascade Volcanoes are basically going quiet, but this strata volcano is usually extremely quiet, just like Mount Hood. I think Shasta is actually the California equivalent of Oregon's Mount Hood. The largest event was actually two 0.6 earthquakes, as you can see right here. One striking at 11.6 kilometers in depth far to the southeast down here, just beyond the base. And the other striking at 7.0 kilometers in depth actually under the base, under the southeastern base, excuse me. Though much closer to the strata volcano, since I like to use events that are closer to the volcano, especially when dealing with multiple events of the same magnitude, I will use this one right here. It struck on March 10th, 2019 at 0.50 UTC. Here we have the data stream supposedly from the closest seismic station to this earthquake. Uh, it's barely noticeable, I'll show you that in just a second. It's station LGY in the NC network, which is a broadband station, so I've added a filter. Now this earthquake must have been extremely weak. Again, we have station LGY in the NC network here. According to the USGS and the California Integrated Seismic Network, this magnitude 0.6 event under Mount Shasta occurred on March 10, 2019 at 0050. 13 UTC with station LGY in the NC network detecting the first seismic wave, the P wave, two seconds after it occurred. So we should see it at 005015 or so, right? Well, I believe it is this event right here. You're going to say, Ben, I don't see any event starting right here. Well, uh, I really don't either. It's barely noticeable. And notice I have the same channel as listed on the USGS event page. This event is barely noticeable on the closest seismic station. Personally, I think some of the seismic stations around Mount Shasta need a big update. The, apparently, they say it was this event right here, starting right here. We notice there's a slight increase in energy. Let's go to the seismogram plot. You can barely see anything at all. You pretty much need a spectrogram to actually see the event right here. Apparently, they say the P wave started right about here or so. So I'm really not seeing it unless this is it right here, but I don't know. A lot of the largest events reported from Mount Shasta I try to find and they're just show up so weak on these stations. Hopefully they get some new stations or maybe the earthquakes are just weak in general. And here we are at the last volcano in the update, Lassen Peak in Northern California. Again, Glacier Peak in Washington State will be added to the update once new instruments are installed. This is a volcano which resides in Northern California, just 60 miles to the southeast of Mount Shasta. For the month of March 2019, there were only 17 earthquakes reported for Lassen Peak, which is much lower than last month's total of 40 earthquakes. Last month's seismicity was greater, I believe, due in part to an earthquake swarm. Nothing too major has occurred, however, and the volcano remains at background levels. The largest reported events were two magnitude 0.8 earthquakes. One occurred under Lassen Peak itself, you can see right there, at 3.5 kilometers in depth, and one occurring far to the northwest at 9.8 kilometers in depth right up here. So let's use the closest one to the volcano, which was, uh, it's this one right here, which struck on March 2nd, 2019 at 404 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots of the largest event to occur under Lassen Peak Volcanic Center for the month of March 2019. Notice something very interesting that we see the same strange, almost monochromatic signal with this earthquake that we have seen for some of the earthquakes at Mount Rainier. It is much easier to see on the spectrogram here than on the seismogram up here. Also interesting to note is that, again, just like the ones at Mount Rainier we see with this strange high frequency signal, this one starts right when the earthquake started. It also dies down alongside the earthquake and also carries basically the same main frequency of about 22.7 hertz. The main frequency of this strange high frequency signal on the earthquakes at Mount Rainier that are seen from time to time is 22.3 hertz. That is almost identical to what we've been seeing at Mount Rainier. So I must beg the question, what is this strange signal? I think it's very strange. Why would that even be happening? Here we are at the GPS deformation stations for Lassen Volcanic Center. Let's choose P666. I would have chosen a better name, but <laughs> I don't know. Okay, 
So when viewing these uh, blue deformation charts, the top two show horizontal deformation with east showing east-west and north showing north-south. And the bottom chart here shows vertical deformation, in other words, uplift or subsidence. Now beforehand, I thought many of these obvious deformation patterns, like the one seen here, here, and here, showing also on the horizontal charts, were caused by an increased supply of magma below. I may have been wrong about that. Although these seem to appear on other stations in the area, I have discovered it could possibly be connected to ice buildup on the machine during winter. That is possible, and these spikes do coincide with winter and do occur almost suddenly, but I don't know. That is up to you to decide. I was going to create some GPS charts, some custom ones for the Lawson area, but check this out. First off, for P666, it's done. So right here would be the most recent, right? This is November 2018, so pretty much around Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas! Turn it off the GPS charts! <laughs> But around Christmas time, apparently the uh, P666 did go offline. So, Ben, why don't you use the GPS data from the surrounding stations in the area? Okay, let's go to 664. P664 has been glitching out a lot. And no recent data. Okay, so let's try uh, P6667. 667, excuse me. There is no recent data as well for here. Okay, let's go to 665. Uh, no recent data here as well. Okay, let's go up here. P668. No recent data here as well. Uh, what? P670, which wouldn't make any sense because it's too far away from Lassen Peak. Doesn't show any data here as well. The only one... Oh, actually, let's check 671. Even 671 is offline. The only one that's working pretty much wouldn't be able to detect any type of real deformation since it's a good distance to the west, 669. This is online. It is showing subsidence currently, but it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Yeah, uh, so this is the only station with the most recent data, but it's not really worth making my own GPS chart for this station. Why are these offline, guys? I really don't like that these GPS stations are offline. So really, there is no way to actively monitor for deformation on Lassen Peak right now. There is no way because the recent data stream was cut at about Christmas. maybe. So it's been offline for maybe about four months now. So uh, if USGS is seeing this, I highly doubt they are. But if they are, if you're listening, please, can you try to uh, put these stations back online? That would be very nice. Pretty, pretty, please. You know, Lassen Peak last explosively erupted back in 1915 and is actually the first volcanic eruption to be extensively photographed. Yes, they have very real photos of the Lassen Peak eruption in 1915. Just type Lassen Peak 1915 into Google. Also, I just checked to see if I could download the data to these GPS stations, but apparently they are still offline even to this day. The only ones online, again, are not exactly the volcano itself, and it's only this one right here that is online. So, I really hope they get them back up and running soon. And here we are back at the wonderful Upper Geyser Basin, home to the infamous Old Faithful Geyser at Yellowstone National Park in Caldera. This is Old Faithful right here. Geyser Hill's back here. It's steaming a good amount today. Split Cone Geyser right back here. It looks more active back here than usual, and back here looks a little more calm than usual. But Old Faithful's puffing steam as usual. Still got a little bit of snow on the sidewalks, but other than that, I think it's just rain now. I think it's a little bit too warm for snow. So it seems, of course, that Yellowstone and Long Valley supervolcanoes have the highest seismicity counts out of all the volcanoes I showed for the month of March 2019, with a good-sized burst in seismicity at Mount St. Helens. Cascade volcanoes seem to be keeping their pattern of diminishing seismicity, all except for Newberry, which saw a few more low-frequency events, and Mount St. Helens. This is not major, but definitely something to keep an eye on. You never know. Of course, concerning activity at any of these volcanoes will warrant its own video and its own blog post on my website, especially if increased deformation is spotted in conjunction with increased seismicity, almost a sure sign that a magma chamber is starting to grow restless for an approaching eruption or major intrusion event. For those who watch my videos, please check out my website. My site is helpful in conjunction with my YouTube videos, and it already contains a great many pages with hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images for many different events at many different volcanoes. I will also be able to upload more information on there than if I was only making YouTube videos, so if you like, go check it out. 
The link to it is below my email address in the description box below. The next monthly update will be for April 2019, which will be uploaded a few days after the month has ended. I usually try to get my updates out around the 5th of every month, but sometimes it doesn't work out. I hope to someday become more educated in regards to volcanoes and earthquakes and hope to someday become a volcanic seismologist, but I am already equipped to give you guys a heads up if concerning activity may ever rear its ugly head. Any support would be amazing, guys, and no, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about personal support from you viewers. Thank you all and keep your heads up and please be prepared with, at the very least, two weeks of food and water per person within your household. Please double that per child you have under the age of 12, just in case. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of food, but after all, when disaster strikes, you can never be too prepared. It is better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. If any mistakes have occurred or I am wrong about something, please feel free to let me know below. I am actually a chill guy that is okay with constructive criticism. Keyword there is constructive, guys. Sadly, the world, and especially YouTube, has too big of an ego right now to think any constructive criticism is a good thing, especially many specific YouTubers. This is why I rarely watch YouTube videos anymore. I, I still do, but not as much. I simply rely on the data for my research while making YouTube videos and blog posts so people can enjoy and learn from the research I spend so much time on. I will always stand for the truth, no matter where it leads. Why? Because the truth is considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. God bless. Please stay safe and let me know what you think. Ben Ferriolo, signing off.